Greetings. I'm Dr. Jason Ozuko from the psychology department at SUNY Geneseo. And today we will be continuing our overview of PsychoPi. In our last video, we covered a lot of the basics uh, of PsychoPi, and I gave you an overview of how PsychoPi works and what routines and components are. And we also looked at uh, stimuli and input components. Today, we're going to look at the more advanced features that you need in PsychoPi in order to take those components and turn them into an actual experiment. Because so far, we've just placed individual uh, routines on the timeline. But an actual experiment is composed of more than just individual routines. There's one big component we haven't looked at yet, and that is loops. And so almost every experiment you can think of is going to involve loops in some way. For instance, imagine you have a survey that you want participants to fill out and you have 10 questions. You could insert 10 individual questions on your timeline, but that is not the correct way to do it. The correct way is to insert one question and then to have a loop that contains your 10 individual questions and have your 10 questions systematically fill out that one question uh, and go through uh, your experiment that way. You might be a cognitive psychologist and you might have uh, maybe a series of Stroop trials or study trials or rating trials or whatever you'd like. And it wouldn't make sense to have a timeline of 50 or 60 different trials um, in that case of separate routines. Instead, what you want is a loop. So loops are a very core component of what PsychoPi does. So for instance, in my experiment here, I had a welcome screen, a trial, and a goodbye screen. On my trial, I was showing uh, a single fruit. We'll actually take away the polygon because we don't need it anymore. And I'm gonna change the fruit to last for only two seconds. In my images folder, I actually have four different fruits. And so let's say that I wanted to show each of those fruits two subjects. As I just described, you don't want to go in and create an apple, uh, banana, grape, and orange trial on your timeline. And there's a variety of reasons you wouldn't want to do that. First of all, it's not very flexible. If later on I added uh, pineapple and peach, I'd have to go in and add more trials, and it's very tedious to do that. Uh, and second of all, you can't randomly order your stimuli uh, across your subjects as you might want to do. So if I code in apple, banana, grape, and orange trials into my timeline, I have no control over randomizing them. Um, so loops allow you to solve that problem. So to insert a loop into your PsychoPy uh, experiment, simply click on insert loop. And just like when you insert a routine, you'll get an option of where to insert this loop. Now loops have two points, a start and an end. So I want my loop to encompass the beginning of the trial. And in this case, we'll just have it go around to the end of the trial like this. So the loop will now go like this. The loop properties are brought up once you've selected both points. I'm gonna call this uh, my fruit trials, if I can spell. And then you have a series of options. So notice that by default, loops are set to randomly order your stimuli. Um, by default, this is what you usually want. So if we imagine my loop is gonna show all four fruits, we want these fruits to appear randomly. However, if you want, you can have the fruits occur in order. So maybe I always want apple, banana, grape, and orange, or maybe I want a different order. Maybe I want grape, banana, orange, apple. Um, I, I'll show you in a minute where you can specify the order, but you can specify a fixed order and then have the items come out always in that order, and that would be the sequential option. There are a few other options here for more specific situations, and you can look that up in the PsychoPy documentation. But 90% of the time, you want random. 10% of the time, you want sequential. And then in the fringe case, you might want one of the other options. You have this checkbox here that says, is trials. And you usually want to leave this checked if this is trials. Now, you might imagine, well, what other use for a loop is there? And one of the other biggest uses for loops are things called blocks. So maybe if you want to have uh, a set of fruits as one block and you want to have a set of animals as another block and a set of houses as another block. So maybe you want to have multiple blocks of stimuli that you're going to show to subjects. 
Uh, in that case, if you're specifying the loop that's going to arrange blocks, and we'll look at that today so you get a better idea of what I'm talking about, uh, you typically want to uncheck this. And the only reason is because it will change how PsychoPy logs your data. And usually, when you're using loops that are not being used to specify trials, you don't want this checked because it will... Uh, not mess up your data file, but it just is unnecessary. So make sure this is checked for loops that are specifying trials. But other than that, you don't need it checked. But if you leave it checked, it's not the end of the world. Next, you have some options here. Number of repetitions, selected rows, random seed, and conditions. So first of all, random seed is a very handy parameter to alter. Uh, this basically determines how PsychoPy will randomize your stimulus list. So if this is left blank, then every time your stimuli are randomized, they're randomized into a new order, meaning that every new subject that runs in your experiment will get a separate order of your stimuli, in my case, these four fruits. However, let's say I want my fruits to appear in a random order, but the same random order for every subject. Well, then here under random seed, I just need to specify a number. And that number can be anything. So I could specify it as one. I could run my experiment and see what random order uh, my stimuli come out in. If I don't like that random order, I can pick a different number. And I can just keep changing this until I settle on a number that I like. And then that random order will be the same random order that is always used for um, all your subjects. So it's like having a fixed order, but that order is shuffled. Next, we have number of repetitions, which is how many times should this loop repeat? And we'll come back to exploring what this number means and how you use it later. But for right now, I'm going to set it to one. Then you have selected rows. Selected rows is a parameter that allows you to specify which items out of your condition sheet you're going to be using. We'll explore this more in a follow-up video where we build our first experiment. Today is just an introduction of loops, but we'll build a more functional experiment um, in our next class together. Um, and lastly, we have an option for a condition file. So the condition file is a CSV or Excel file that specifies which stimuli are going to actually be in your loop. So we have four fruits that are in this loop, and they are image files that exist in a folder uh, near our experiment. So we have to tell PsychoPy where these images are, and the way we do that is by creating an Excel sheet. So I'm going to create a new Excel worksheet here, and I will call it the fruit stimuli, or the fruit stims. Now, in order to specify your stimuli in a sheet here, your first row needs to be a list of variables that you can deal with in PsychoPy. So loops are going to be our introduction to the idea of variables. So I have four fruits. I'm going to call the variable that holds the fruit name the fruit underscore image. You cannot use spaces in variable names, so don't put fruit space images. You can't use decimals or periods, so don't use fruit underscore image, or sorry, period images. Use fruit underscore images. You also can't use dashes, so don't do fruit dash images. There's all sorts of key, uh, there's all sorts of special characters you can't use. So if you want a space or a separator of any kind, just use an underscore. That is a safe character to use. Other than that, just use letters. Um, it's not advisable to put numbers in, but you can at the end of your variables, but never start a variable with numbers. It can cause problems. So you might want fruit images too. Put the two at the end if you need to. Okay, now you might imagine, well, this variable is going to hold my fruit names and variables are filled out uh, vertically. So here are my fruit names, apple.png, banana.png, grape.png, and orange.png. So let's just go ahead and fill that in, grape.png and orange.png. Okay, let's see what happens now. I'm going to save my Excel sheet. And notice that my Excel sheet is in the root folder right near my experiment. 
So now uh, in PsychoPy here, I can actually specify my file and I'll see it right there. And when I open it up, it detects that there are four conditions with one parameter. So the parameter is the variable name and there it's detected the parameter fruit images and it's detected there are four separate conditions. So here's condition one, two, three, and four. So with this, let's click OK and let's go into my trial loop here. Now, before we get to trying to take these image names and display them, let's just insert a text box and I'll show you um, how you use variables uh, from your loop. So we're actually going to call this the debug text because this is just here for our own purposes. Now, what we would like to see is the content of fruit images. So the way our loop is going to work is we have four conditions and we set it to random. So on any particular trial, it's going to grab one of these values and the variable fruit images will be equal to that value. So if on the first trial it grabs banana, then fruit images will be equal to banana.png. Second trial orange, then fruit images becomes equal to orange and so on. So our loop, even though we set it to have one repetition, it's one repetition of our entire sheet. So you don't need to set n reps to four. If you did, you would go through the entire sheet four times. That would give you 16 trials. So instead, when you are using an Excel sheet, you can set number of repetitions to one and it will go through the entire sheet once. So we're gonna get four trials out of our experiment here. And what I would like to do first of all is just see uh, what fruit images is equal to. So under my debug text, I'm going to set the text to be equal to fruit underscore images. And you might think, okay, now we are going to be able to see fruit images. However, there's two little things you have to change. First of all, if I just run my experiment as is, I'll show you. Rather than seeing the value of fruit images, I literally see the word fruit underscore images. And notice that nothing is changing. Um, you know, it was just one long continuous trial. No fruits were changing anything like that. Um, one thing I'm going to do uh, just while we're here is insert my blank routine into my loop. So when you insert a new routine, you can insert them outside or inside the loop. I want a blank between my trials. And if I run my experiment again, you'll see why I did that. It's so that I can tell when a trial ends because where I just showed you, it was just one long continuous thing and it wasn't really clear that we were even going through separate trials. So now you get the sense that, okay, a fruit is on the screen for two seconds and then it disappears. Well, let's go back to our main problem of how do we actually see the variable contents and not just the variable name? Well, in PsychoPy, in order to actually indicate that you don't want to see this text, but instead you want this to be treated as variable, you put a dollar sign in front of your text. And notice that the font changed. Right before, this is the text we were going to see. As soon as I put a dollar sign, PsychoPy recognizes, okay, now you actually want me to look for a variable called fruit images and show you those contents. The second change we have to make is over here. This, this indicator here that says constant, what this means is that when the experiment begins, PsychoPy is going to look for a variable called fruit images. It's going to set this text box to be equal to the value of that variable and that will be it. However, when the experiment begins over here on the timeline, the Excel sheet hasn't even been opened up yet. The Excel sheet doesn't get opened up until the loop. So, so if you run your experiment right now, PsychoPy is going to give you an error. And it's because fruit images doesn't exist. So when you are in a loop and you are trying to access variables that come from an Excel sheet, you need to change this to either set every repeat or set every frame. And what this means, set every repeat, means that when the loop begins, PsychoPy is going to access your Excel sheet, it's going to grab the first fruit images, and then it's going to assign that to this text box. Then when the loop repeats, it's going to grab a new value and it's going to set that 
equal to fruit images, and that will be what gets set in your text box. So set every repeat means every single time the loop repeats, update the contents of this variable and this text box. Set every frame will work as well. Where set every frame is handy is, uh, as we'll see in later videos, you can actually have code that changes the value of variables while the trial is on the screen. So you can, for instance, maybe you want to have an animation and you have some custom code that every one second is changing uh, fruit images to a different uh, fruit value. Then if you uh, selected set every repeat, then this text box would only be updated when the trial begins. But if your code in the background every second is changing things, you won't see any of those changes. So set every frame is what you'd want if you had a variable that was changing while the routine was staying on the screen. Um, for our purposes, it doesn't make any difference which one you pick, but set every repeat is usually what you want to be selecting when you know a variable is only changing once um, every loop. And that's what this variable will be doing. Uh, once a loop, it will update to a new value. Okay, if we run the experiment now, what we will see is that rather than seeing fruit underscore images, we will actually get to see uh, names of randomly selected fruits. And you can see this went grape, apple, banana, orange. So that's the order of our stimuli. So how do we actually get the image to change? Because I just put up this text box as a debug thing so we could see what the fruit images variable is equal to. Well, it's very simple. The same logic that we used in order to edit our text box works on our images. So rather than the image being hard coded as Apple, we can change our image to be uh, the fruit underscore uh, images variable. And we'll have to put a dollar sign in front of it. But other than that, um, and we'll have to change this to set every repeat. But other than those few changes, that will work. However, before we make that change, note one thing. I've made an error here. So the image that needs to be loaded is images slash apple. The reason is because our experiment is running here. If we simply tried to load apple, it would look around this folder and say, hey, I can't find an apple and PsychoPy would crash. So if you simply typed in fruit underscore mid images, and you set this to set every repeat so it would update every cycle, and you tried to run this as is, it wouldn't work. The reason is because over here, we actually need to add the images folder to our file names. So rather than Apple, we want images slash Apple. And note, by the way, that I'm using a forward slash. Even in here, when you manually select uh, and uh, a fruit, uh, PsychoPy is giving you the backslash. If you leave the backslashes in your experiment, your experiment will crash when you go to run it online. You actually need to change these to forward slashes. So if you have any manually selected uh, image files, make sure, if, and you're on a Windows computer, I think on Mac they come out as forward slash, but don't quote me on that because I don't have a Mac. Uh, but in any case, you need to make sure you're using forward slashes to indicate folder uh, versus file. So we're going to uh, change this back to uh, fruit underscore images. And I've got set every repeat. And then in my Excel sheet, I'm going to go through and I'm going to add images and then a forward slash before each fruit name. There we go. All right, make sure to save your Excel sheet. And then you can come back in here and we have fruit images set every repeat. We no longer need the debug text, so we can simply uh, remove this. And now we can run our experiment. And now we will see that we are showing uh, separate images randomly in our loop. So this one started with an apple, but there we go, banana orange, and this one will be grape. So creating loops in PsychoPy is really just that simple. Um, loops basically depend on Excel sheets. We'll see in future how you can use loops without Excel sheets. You have parameters or variables in your sheets. You specify them, 
you access them by using the dollar sign and then the heading label that you've given or the variable name. And from there, uh, things are sort of displayed on the screen. Now, in your loop, you can actually have multiple columns. So for instance, maybe I don't just want fruits on the screen, but I want fruits to be in different positions, and maybe I want fruits to be different uh, sizes. So fruit position and fruit size. So let's look in the image properties here, because you can use a variable to specify the image name, but you can use a variable to specify anything. And look, these, these uh, parameters here even have dollar signs built into them because they're expecting you to use some kind of variable. So by default, fruits are 0 0.5, 0 0.5. What if we change this? What if we say, so the apple can be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, but I want the banana to be 0 0.25, 0 0.5. I want the grape to be 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and I want the orange to be tiny, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And rather than all be centered at zero, you know, the apple can be centered at zero for reference, but the banana will be 0 0.20, the grape will be, how about negative 0 0.20, and the orange will be negative 0.2, negative 0.2. I can save this, and then here in my image, rather than using the width and height of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, I can use fruit underscore size, and again, make sure to set this to every repeat. A very common problem I see in people's scripts when they're just getting started is they forget to change this, they go to run their experiment, and PsychoPy says, an error message that fruit size or fruit position doesn't exist. And they think, what the heck, it's in, it's in the Excel sheet. But the Excel sheet doesn't get loaded until the loop begins. So if at the beginning of the experiment, PsychoPy is looking for fruit size, because this is constant, then you're going to get an error. So make sure every time you're using a variable, that's changed to set every repeat. And with those, we have to make one other change. And that is that if you look in the loop, PsychoPy still thinks there's only four conditions with one parameter. It doesn't know about these other two yet. So we have to select our file and we have to reselect fruit stims so that it now detects, oh, there's not only fruit images, but fruit position and fruit size. If we run this, we now should get fruits that are in different positions and that have been uh, distorted. And there we go. And we might have, yes, <laughs> we didn't see our orange because rather than putting 0.2, I put 2. So it was off the screen. So there was a little typo in my Excel sheet, but I'll run it again there and we'll see the orange. And there's our grape, our banana, our apple, nice and centered, and our tiny little orange. And there we go. Now you can include all sorts of variables. You could, uh, you know, if you were affecting text, you could change the font size, the font color, the font type. You could have a variable for orientation, flip, anything you want. Now, before we move on from loops for the remainder of the video, I wanted to show you uh, or introduce the idea of using loops for more than just trials. So you can use loops for blocks as well. And to do this, I'm going to insert a few more images into my images folder. So here are just some squares of blue, green, red, and yellow. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to change these back to default because I don't actually want things all moving around green. And you can leave these a set of repeater constant. It's not going to hurt anything. Um, and now I'm going to get rid of these columns too. Let's imagine that we actually wanted to have two blocks of trials. So we wanted subjects to see four fruits and then four colored squares. Or in some cases, we wanted that to be uh, reversed. Well, we could go in here and create a new trial and a new blank and a new loop and call it uh, sort of colored trials. However, if we did that, then fruits would always come before the colored trials. So you easily could do that. You could make a new Excel sheet that contains the names of the uh, four colors. Based on what we've done here with the fruits, you can extend that logic yourself and do that if you like. However, I want to be a little more flexible than that. So instead, I would like to uh, be able to maybe randomly decide 
whether people are going to see fruits or colored squares first. So how could I do that? Well, first of all, I'm going to have to go and create an Excel sheet for my colored squares here. So I'm going to come up and make a new Excel sheet here, and I will call it uh, the square stims. And in here, I'm going to have stim underscore images. And the images were, again, blue, green, red, and yellow. So images slash blue dot PNG, images slash green. You don't have to put things in alphabetically. You can put them in whatever order you want. You know, yellow dot B, yellow can come before red. It doesn't make a difference. And there we go. Make sure, though, you do pay attention to capitalization. If you've capitalized the B in blue, make sure it's capital here. Make sure you're consistent with things. It's usually easier just to have everything be lower or uppercase. Uh, but if you want to get fancy, you can. Just make sure um, that you've got the correct capitalizations. And again, don't put spaces in your file names. Use underscores if you need to. It creates problems. Uh, it can create problems when you run things online if you have spaces. Typically, it won't. But, you know, online files, uh, just it's better not to have spaces in their file names. Okay, so square stems is here. Going back to my fruit images, I'm going to change this to stem underscore images so that the uh, variable name is consistent between my fruits and uh, my squares. And if I come in here, I can change the name of my image fruit to, let's say, let's make it more generic, image stem. And again, we're going to go with stem underscore images. And now my loop, which we can change this from trials fruit to trials stem. My loop can basically now load either Excel sheet because it'll be stem images in fruit or stem images in squares. And so what I did is I changed the file name so that everything is consistent among my two Excel sheets. So now my loop really doesn't care if I'm loading uh, squares or fruits. So I can run it now with my squares just as easily as I was able to uh, with my fruits. And we'll see that uh, here. So there you go. We can see squares now. Now, how do we take this, though, and actually create uh, blocks? Well, we do this through adding a second loop. So if you click to insert a loop, you can actually insert a loop that goes around your first loop. And we're going to call this the stem blocks, or block stem in my case. I'm going to leave it as random, and I'm going to uncheck that this is trials, because again, this isn't trials. And I'll have number of repetitions as one, and we'll leave the rest as blank for right now. And just so you can see, so what's happening is this is a big loop that's going to loop my trials. And so I have two Excel sheets that I would like to have looped, my square stems and my fruit stems. And if you think about how we were able to loop our four stimuli in our trials loop, you might start to get a sense of how we're going to do it with the block loop. So maybe in here, rather than having a hard-coded conditions file, I use a variable, which I will call cond file, or short for condition file. And if I did that, then in here, I could load an Excel sheet that had the variable cond file, and it had two values. One was fruit underscore stims dot xlsx, and one was square dot underscore stims dot xlsx. So a new Excel sheet, cond file, we have fruit underscore stims, xlsx and uh, square underscore stims dot xlsx and we will call this the conditions now here i can load up my conditions excel sheet and notice that i have con file and that it has two conditions and this is the one parameter now in my loop rather than uh, hard coding in uh, fruits or squares, we're going to loop these trial loops twice. And each time 
we will load up a different Excel sheet as our stimuli. And off we go. So in this case, we first got the squares. And when the squares are finished, then we will get the fruits. And it's just that easy. Now, this allows you to block your stimuli very easily. If you'd like, you can actually even have screens in between your blocks. So maybe we want to insert a text screen at the beginning of each block. So we can insert a routine. And we'll call this the block instructions. And I'm going to put it, so note you can put it before the blocks even begin. You can also put it in here. And so it is being looped within the block loop, but it doesn't get looped every single trial. And we can say here, this will be your block uh, instructions. And I can say the next block is about to begin. And we can just leave that for a couple of seconds on the screen. Let's say three seconds. And if I run my experiment now, you'll see that message before the beginning of block. So the next block is about to begin. This time it ended up being fruits. And when that is done, then you will see... The next block is about to begin, and now we will see our squares. So using block loops, you can actually create separate blocks of stimuli. You can have all sorts of routines and screens in addition to the loops themselves that occur with each block. You can, you know, have, if you later decide that you always want fruits to come first, you can change this to sequential, and then fruits will always come before squares. If you want squares to come first, Leave it as sequential and simply put squares ahead of fruits in your uh, Excel sheet. You can leave it as random. In later videos, we'll look at what you can do if you want to counterbalance your blocks. But for now, this should give you a pretty good sense of how loops work and how they can be used to create both loops of stimuli and blocks in your experiment. So the last thing that I wanted to touch on today, we've looked at how you run experiments locally. Um, the entire time we've been working together. Every single time we run the experiment, we run it locally. However, today I wanted to show you how to run this experiment online. Because especially these days, more and more people are running their experiments online. So we are going to upload this experiment as is online. So I have already gone in and logged in with my user ID. So I'm now going to select new experiment here. And we're going to call this demo one loops. Now, after you've named your experiment, you also need to specify a local folder where the experiment exists. So that is this folder here that I've created uh, for my uh, experiment. You can give this experiment a description if you would like. You can add tags if you would like. You can make this experiment public if you would like. I'm going to leave all this as default because in my case, it doesn't really matter. And I'm going to click Create Project on Pavlovia. Now, at this point, if you do get an error like I've just gotten, just click OK. And actually, everything is still working. If you get this uh, pop-up here that says it would like to commit changes, then you know things are still working. Um, now, every time you sync or update an experiment online, this pop-up will come up. And until you've clicked OK on this pop-up, you haven't actually uploaded any uh, files. Now notice that uh, we are detecting 102 files. If we go back into our experimental folder, the files that are being detected are my image files, my Excel sheet, and my experiment files, and actually all the data that has been accumulating every single time I've run the experiment. I don't actually care if this data gets uploaded, but it's not going to hurt anything, so I will let it get uploaded. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out here before we click OK and begin our first online upload is that here is our PsychoPy experiment file. This is the file that you would have to copy to another computer if you wanted to edit it. Here is a file called uh, our experiment underscore last run dot py. This is the Python code that gets generated from our abstract uh, experiment representation in PsychoPy. And this is the actual code that runs our experiment. 
Now, because we've only ever run our experiment locally, uh, we don't have any other files, but as we will see in a moment, there will be JavaScript files and HTML files that are generated once we click OK. If you are ever trying to upload your experiment online and you go and you look in your experiment folder and you don't see JavaScript and HTML files, then your experiment has not been compiled for online use yet and you probably didn't click on this play button as I did or the new button that I did. So you have to go and try and create a new experiment and get it uploaded and you should then see the JavaScript and HTML files. Uh, the other thing is, just as a reminder, you only ever want to put one experiment per folder. So this one underscore orientation folder that I've created, if I ever want to make a second experiment, that's got to go in a different folder. If I put it in the same folder and I try to upload both experiments to uh, Pavlovia, things are not going to work. So one experiment per folder. I'm going to click OK. And it looks like nothing is really happening. It looks like PsychoPy might even have frozen, but that's PsychoPy just doing it, its thing. It usually pauses while it uploads all this information online. And you can see in my output here, my runner, it says pushing files to Pavlovia. And this is what you want to see. And you see a success here. That means my experiment was actually pushed to Pavlovia and it is now online. Okay, my experiment is now online. So first of all, let's go take a look at it and then let's run it. Now, after logging into Pavlovia, you should be brought to your dashboard. And if not, just click on your dashboard. Then click under experiments and you should see the experiment that you just uploaded. If you click into your experiment, you will be brought to your experimental control panel where you can control the flow of your experiment and you can inspect your experiment. So after you've uploaded your experiment, you can click on view code and this will allow you to see what files you've actually uploaded. And so you can see here that everything that is in my experimental folder, my Excel sheets, my Python files, my images, they're all now on PsychoPy. Note, however, there's no JavaScript and there's no HTML files. So if I were to try and run this experiment, it would not work. And coming back to my experimental control panel anyway, my experiment is actually set to inactive. So no matter what I did, if I tried to run this online, it wouldn't work. So in order to run our experiment online, we need to change two things. First of all, we need to go and compile the JavaScript version. And you do that by clicking on uh, this Run Study Online button. By clicking this, your experiment will be compiled into JavaScript. And note that I haven't changed anything in my experimental folder, but it now says that there are three new files. If we look in our folder, we'll see there now is an uh, orientation experiment.js, that's JavaScript. We have a legacy browser version and we have an index.html. Those are the files that are needed to run your experiment online and those are the three new files. Now, every time you commit changes, you can uh, have a summary of the changes and some details for your own notes. Uh, if you would like to add notes, you certainly can. I'm just going to click OK. And if you come to your runner, you should see, see a message saying it's pushing changes and then it was successful. When it is successful, it will bring up your web browser and we'll take a look at that in a moment. But I just wanted to show you something else that PsychoPy opened up was the coder. And the coder contains the JavaScript version of your experiment. So this is the actual code that is going to run your experiment online. And all of this code was generated from your experimental abstraction in the builder. So again, as we discussed in the prior video, what you see in the builder here is not the actual code that ever runs your experiment. This is more like a blueprint for how PsychoPy should build a Python script or in the online case, a JavaScript in order to represent your experiment. So here's the actual under the hood code that's gonna run your experiment. You typically don't need to do much with this, but we'll see in later videos it can be helpful for debugging. All right, now your web browser should have come up with this page by itself uh, when you click that Run Online button. And this says that your demo is currently inactive and cannot be run. If you are the experiment designer, go to the experiment page. So we can just click on this, and this will take us right to the experimental page. And here's where I said our experiment was inactive, so nothing we could do could even run it. Before we change it into one of its run modes, let's just check the code and make sure 
that our JavaScript and our index files are indeed uploaded, and they are. And so now we can come in here and we can turn on piloting mode. With piloting mode turned on, we can now pilot our experiment. The other mode that you'll eventually want to use is the running mode. And when the experiment is in running mode, you can run it and you can give a link to subjects to run. Um, the other options here indicate how you want your data saved and give you an option to download your results. When your experiment is in piloting mode, no data is being saved on the servers. Instead, as we will see, each subject who pilots the experiment, when they quit the experiment, their own data will download to their computer automatically. Typically, you're the person doing the piloting. So when you run your experiment, the data downloads immediately. You can go and you could scrutinize the data file and make sure that everything came out the way you need it to. Um, however, you can also get the piloting link. So when I click pilot, it's going to go open up a new tab in my web browser. I could copy that URL and give it to uh, another researcher or a colleague, and they on their own computer could run my experiment. And again, it will be in piloting mode, so no data will be stored on the server. But you can share your pilot URL with uh, collaborators so that multiple people can evaluate your online experiment to see if it's uh, working correctly. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and click pilot and notice that my experiment now uh, will eventually here load. And so a few things happened right there. So I get my participant and session startup parameters just like offline. However, note that uh, there were a series of resources that were downloaded. Those are the image files that my experiment needs to show. Um, if you go to run an online experiment and you know you have images or sounds or movies and nothing gets downloaded, then you've got a problem where PsychoPy didn't map the stimuli files uh, to your uh, experiment. And the way you would fix that is by going back into the coder, selecting the online tab, and adding in additional resources. So simply going in and selecting images that were being missed. And you'll know these images are being missed because when you go to run your experiment, right, so I can add as many files as I want, uh, you'll know that these images are being missed because when you go to run your experiment, nothing will be downloaded. And then when the first image is supposed to appear, PsychoPy will say, cannot find apple.png. And you'll think that's strange because it's in the experimental folder. Well, you need to add it in manually because for whatever reason, PsychoPy didn't detect it. Also, if you add any other startup parameters to your experiment, they will show up here just like in the offline version. If you go to run your online experiment and you get a 403 error, it says permission is denied, then one of two things has happened. Either you have not set your experiment to be active and so it is still inactive, or your JS and HTML files were never generated and so there's no online files for Pavlovia to access. So you have to make sure that those JS and HTML files uh, not only get generated locally and exist in your experiment folder, but when you go to view code in Pavlovia, you see them in your experimental directory. Okay, we can click OK. And you'll see here that the experiment online runs identically uh, to offline. So things are very close in terms of how PsychoPy translates the Python to the JavaScript. As we'll see in more advanced uh, class topics, especially when you're adding in custom code, there are cases where you have to come up with uh, some alternative versions of Python code in order to get things to work in JavaScript, but we'll save those for uh, another day. As you can see, we have also downloaded our data from our experiment. If you were to open this data file, it would look identical to the data files that you've been saving locally on your computer. The only caveat is that the uh, different columns are arranged slightly differently typically in the online version versus the offline version. So if you want to merge data from offline and online sources, be aware of that. You can't just do a standard merge because the columns are not aligned uh, the same. But anyway, that completes our look at PsychoPy, our initial first look. So we have gone through all the basics of PsychoPy from how to use it to what it is to how to insert routines and loops and components, how to get things running locally and online. In the remainder of our online class, we're going to be building our first full experiment in our next video. 
And then we'll begin to uh, broach more and more advanced topics, looking at how to build more complex experiments, how to deal with more complex scenarios, um, and ultimately, hopefully, leave you with a mastery of PsychoPy. So I hope this video was helpful to you. If you haven't subscribed already to the channel, make sure you do so. And if you are in need of some help with your PsychoPy experiments, I offer both consulting and programming services, the details of which are provided in the description of this video below. Don't hesitate to reach out if you think I could help you. Other than that, thanks for watching, and I will catch you in the next one.